religion in the name of God that is not uh, worship of God as, as he would want to be worshipped. Now, uh, there's been false religion and false worship ever since there's been true worship. And Satan is always in instigator of false worship. Now, notice that this great harlot sits upon many waters. Well, uh, this uh, figure of speech, many waters, comes uh, from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, and all of the symbols in the book of Revelation come from the Old Testament. And if you were a thorough student of uh, the Old Testament, you would understand all the symbolism in Revelation. This particular symbol uh, comes from uh, Jeremiah 51.13, and most of the symbolism, or a great part of the symbolism, in these two chapters, 17 and 18, come from two chapters in Jeremiah, chapters 50 and 51 in Jeremiah. Those two chapters describe prophetically the destruction of the nation Babylon way back in the 6th century B.C. Babylon at one time was the greatest, most wealthy nation in all the world. And before, or while it was still at its height, the prophet Jeremiah prophesied its destruction. Not only Jeremiah, but also all of the Old Testament prophets spend much time prophesying the downfall of this great country, Babylon. So in Jeremiah, we have the we have the prophecy of the destruction of the literal Babylon. Therefore, many of the, the much of the phraseology that's used there is carried over here when we're speaking of the destruction of not literal Babylon, but figurative Babylon. So the nation of Babylon comes to stand for uh, spiritual idolatry. We'll, we'll explore that a little more as we go along. This term, many waters, is going to be explained for us. We might as well go look now so we won't, we won't have to um, wonder. 15th verse of the 17th chapter. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. For just the great mass of humanity, and over and over again in the Bible, uh, when you see the waters or the seas used figuratively, you're speaking of the great mass of people, just the the conglomerate of nations and peoples and tongues all over the world. That's a figurative language for it. It's used hundreds of times throughout the Bible. And it's explained several times in the Bible, so there's no mistake, could possibly be no mistake, as, uh, as to what is being described. We're back at the second verse now. Sitteth on upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now we're referring here to a, uh, an earlier prediction in the 14th chapter of Revelation. If you'll see uh, chapter 14, verse 8, And there followed another angel, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now we conclude here that this false religious system that's called the great whore or the great harlot has power over the kingdom so that the religious system is able to force government into uh, giving her the praise that is due God. And uh, so it, that's why it says that the great harlot makes the inhabitants of the earth drunk with the wine of her fornication. That is to say, they, be, they lose their, their sense of direction or, or uh, as far as worship is concerned, like a, a person who drinks too much, loses their sense of balance and direction. Uh, they 
do something that they wouldn't ordinarily do, and that is they give their worship and their adoration to a system that they wouldn't normally give it to. And this is because the kings of the earth uh, do it for a reason, and we'll see this unfold. Third verse. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Now this, uh, this figure of speech here is explained for us also earlier in the book of Revelation back in the uh, 13th chapter, the first verse. Where it said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, if we had time to study the 13th chapter of Revelation in this particular sitting, this is what we would find. We would find that in the latter days, after the church or after the born-again people of this age have gone back to be with the Lord, and God leaves the unsaved here on earth, that a world ruler is going to be raised up. And this world ruler, ruler is said to have seven heads because he comes out from a dynasty of seven, which we'll explain. And he said to have ten, cr ten crowns because he has ten kings under him. Or he, he is the, the amalgamated head of ten nations. And uh, his job is going to be uh, uh, blaspheming God. In other words, leading the world against God. To rise up out of the sea simply means that he comes up from among the people. Now notice, for instance, in 1311, we have another beast. Beast means just a, uh, a being which is not very easily described, and so you just call it a beast. Uh, the uh, 13th chapter, the 11th verse. And I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Well, now this second beast came up out of the earth. The first beast came out of the sea. The sea is symbolic for all the nations and peoples of the world, or the Gentiles, or those of the world who aren't Jewish. To come out up out of the land means that uh, or the earth means that the second beast is an Israelite or a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, if you read this, you'd find that he's not a godly man, but he is the one that Christ prophesied in John 5, 43, when he said, I'll come in my came in my Father's name, but you receive me not. Another will come in his own name, and him you will receive. So we find that the nation of Israel, before they turn to God, uh, for their protection, or purportedly for their protection, they're going to give acquiescence to a false leader. Uh, in the prophet Zechariah, uh, Old Testament prophet Zechariah called him the idle shepherd. You can read this yourself. It's in the 11th chapter of the book of Zechariah, the later verses, and it speaks of a shepherd that will come and rule over the nation of Israel. Now, Zechariah prophesied this false shepherd would come uh, he prophesied this 500 and some years before Christ was born. Uh, he prophesied that there would be an evil shepherd. You remember in the 10th chapter of John, Jesus Christ claimed to be the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd that lay down my life for the sheep. Well, that's because, you see, the Old Testament prophets prophesied that two shepherds would come. They prophesied that a good shepherd would come. If you want to read some of those prophecies, you can find it, for instance, in the 40th chapter of the uh, Isaiah, oh, down, uh, I guess, maybe the 14th, 15th verse, something like that. And uh, it said that God is going to send a shepherd. And it will be a tender shepherd, but a strong and mighty shepherd. And then again, uh, in the uh, 34th chapter of Ezekiel, God is condemning the uh, leaders of Israel. At that time, he calls them uh, uh, shepherds who he put over the flock, who muddy up the water and trample the grass and don't go after the, the poor and so forth. And then he says twice in that 34th chapter of Ezekiel, the whole 34th chapter of Ezekiel is about shepherds. 
false shepherd and the true shepherd or the good shepherd. And it's explained that God is going to send one day a good shepherd. And uh, then uh, in, uh, as we said, in uh, Zechariah, you have the prophecy of a good shepherd and a bad shepherd. The whole 11th chapter of Zechariah is about shepherds. So you see, the Old Testament prophets, all the Old Testament prophets, prophesied that God was going to send a good shepherd, the good shepherd would be rejected, and a bad shepherd would be raised up, and the people would accept him as the shepherd. So when Jesus Christ was here, and he says, I am the good shepherd, and he says, you can know the good shepherd because the good shepherd lay down his life for the sheep. And he says, now there's going to be a bad shepherd. As I said, this prophecy is in John 5, 43. There's going to be an evil shepherd. Well, this evil shepherd is this second beast out of the land. It is a, bird, a beast out of the sea and a beast out of the land. It's going to be a world ruler. And uh, he's the one, he's this beast out of the sea. And then he is going to have under him someone who will rule over Israel and who Israel will accept as their Messiah as their king. You can read about it. You can read about both of these. The, the ruler of the world uh, in the first ten verses of uh, Revelation 13, and then uh, the ruler of Israel, the false evil shepherd, uh, which you'll find in the 11th through the 18th verses of the 13th chapter of Revelation. So we find back in our in chapter 17, verse 3, we find that this false religious system here is riding upon that first beast. That is to say, uh, the false religious system controls, just like a a, um, a rider of a horse controls the reins of a horse. She is in the saddle, you might say. Uh, this uh, this one with uh, full of names of blasphemy and so forth is the world ruler. He has the, all the world under his uh, under his authority. But notice he is being reigned and controlled by a religious system. She's on top of the uh, of the world ruler. Now she's not going to stay there. But right here at this point, that's where she is. Fourth verse, 17th chapter. And the woman was arrayed in tar purple and scarlet color and bedecked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness and fornication. Here again, uh, this terminology comes from uh, uh, Jeremiah 51, 17. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations, abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration or wonder. Now, this harlot is called Mystery Babylon. It doesn't mean so much that she's mysterious as it does that uh, it's something hidden or not in full view, like uh, the Bible says that the kingdom of God is now in its mystery form. It's not manifest. It's not openly evident as the kingdom of God. The world does not recognize it as the kingdom of God. We know the kingdom of God is here. We know that we're part of the kingdom of God, but it's in a mystery form or a hidden or an unrevealed form. Well, just the same mystery Babylon as opposed to the great nation of Babylon. See, Babylon was the greatest nation in the world and it made itself known and manifest as the greatest nation in the world. Well, mystery Babylon is not evident as the ruler of the world. She's riding on the horse. That is to say, she's controlling the whole, all the kings of the earth, but not openly. Uh, they give acquiescence to her and obeisance to her but that uh, she is not manifest or shown forth as being the power behind the throne. Why, you see this in, in modified form today. You can think of a great religious leader who pulls the strings 
in many nations. And those kings uh, claim they're the outward sovereign. But they don't do anything without checking with the religious leaders, right? Well, that's just sort of a foreview of uh, what's going to be one day. It's just that everything happens, whatever happens in the Bible has a foreshadowing. You can always be sure of that. Whatever God prophesies that's going to be in the future, it'll always have a foreshadowing before the whole complete thing comes into fruition. And you have the foreshadowing right today of a religious system who controls kings and rulers and people and who forces the people into obedience to that particular system. It's not just one system either. Uh, the one, of course, we're uh, the most familiar with is the religious system, for instance, which controls Spain. So that you got a, uh, uh, at least until just recent months, you couldn't even uh, have a decent funeral or a marriage or worship service or anyway unless you gave obedience to that particular religious system. Well, you have various false religions, but this is what it's talking about here, that uh, this harlot is Babylon in its mystery form. You see, Babylon, when it was in its heyday, ruled all the kings of the earth. All the kings of the earth had to give obedience to and had to surrender and bow down to Babylon. We're going, uh, I, I think next week probably we'll probably get into Daniel and show you where Babylon comes from and where this terminology comes from and you'll see how beautifully it fits the situation here. But mystery Babylon is called the mother of harlots and abominations on earth because uh, it's the epitome of it. And it's the beginning of it, too. A Babylon is the first place where false religion came. Remember, we saw this in the Tower of Babel. Uh, Babel, B-A-D-L, means gate to God. But it's also a, a very singular word in that language, which means confusion, and there's a play on words there. Now, notice in the sixth verse, it says that this great harlot was drunk with the blood of the saints. So true Christians are persecuted. Anytime you see a false religious system, you can be sure that true uh, people, God's true people, will be uh, persecuted and even slaughtered by that religious system. Always. During the tribulation, during the time this is speaking about, uh, all God's people, uh, probably, or a great percentage of them, are going to be martyred. You see those in another place here, by this false religious system. So it says she's drunk with the blood of the true saints. Seventh verse. And the angel said unto me, Why didst thou marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. The, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is or is to be. Notice this phrase, they that dwell on the earth. This phrase is used repeatedly in the book of Revelation and it means those that were left here when uh, the after the saints had gone to be with God. Remember we saw this back in the third chapter of Revelation when we were studying the true church or of the last day, the church of Philadelphia in uh, Revelation 3.10 where it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation or testing which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. That phrase uh, tends to depict those people who are still here when we're going to, when we're going to be with the Lord. It says this beast on which uh, this mystery harlot is riding uh, was and is and is not. Well, that simply means that uh, there was a time 
when the world was ruled by a world ruler. There is a time when the world is not ruled by a world ruler, and there will be another time when the world is ruled by a world ruler. That's what it means. The beast is a world ruler. And it's been so in the past. Just a minute, and you'll see this unfold a little a little more fully. And uh, to to ascend out of the bottom of this pit means that uh, the uh, this world ruler is satanically inspired. Go into perdition means uh, shall end up in, in destruction in God's eternal place of punishment. Ninth verse. And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Now, a person uh, who knows anything about the city of Rome immediately will come to the conclusion that this particular seven mountains means the seven hills upon which Rome is built. You know, you can look in a, uh, uh, any encyclopedia and it'll name the seven hills. What? Yeah. what? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, you got the seven hills of Rome. It's a city built upon seven hills. And uh, it says this woman sits on that the, those seven hills. Well, this leads many to uh, believe then that the, the false woman is Roman Catholicism. Well, I have no doubt, but uh, what uh, Roman Catholicism is a is a uh, core view of this. Uh, I don't know whether it means those seven hills or not. Uh, much Bible prophecy has a double meaning. It, it's uh, it refers to some literal mountains, and then it refers to some figurative ones. Here, I know it refers to figurable, figurative ones, whether it does literal ones or not, because let's look at the next verse, verse it says. And there are seven kings. See, you had seven mountains. Well, in, Bi in the Bible, a mountain is symbolic of a great nation, hills of small countries and mountains of great nations. All through the Bible, you will see when the word mountain is used symbolically, it means a nation a strong nation. And so it's saying there are seven kings. Well, then these seven strong nations have seven rulers. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Now, what we're saying here is the beast is a general term given to each of those times when the world was ruled by a world ruler. Now, according to this, there's been five times in the past when uh, when the world has been ruled by one world, world ruler. And if you go back in history, you'll find this is true. And uh, then uh, one is that means the Roman Empire, which was when John wrote this. And the other is yet to come. Well, there's never yet been since Rome fell. There's never been a one one world ruler, has it? Since Rome fell. See? There were five previous to Rome. Now, these are... Uh, four of these five, as a matter of fact, uh, including Rome, are described and predicted minutely in the uh, book of Daniel. But there were two previous to that. And the reason uh, reason you don't have those described in Daniel is because they came along before Daniel's time. World powers. For instance, the, the ancient Egyptian power at one time, uh, which would not be described as. But what it's saying here is that you remember what the beast is. The beast means a world ruler. And uh, this world ruler, uh, the beast out of the sea, that is, is a world ruler. And uh, uh, there's been any time you have, in this uh, symbolic language, any time you have a one world ruler, you have a beast. But there's five times, when John wrote this, five times, uh, this has been true. And then he says, uh, it's true now. One is, the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. Well, now, look what he's talking about. It's, and look back to Revelation 13, 5 again. He's talking about this one out of the sea. See, the same language is used. 
uh, 13.5, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months, or a short time, exactly three and a half years. We'll, we'll sum this sum up for you in this minute. Eleventh verse. We're back in chapter 17. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now this is talking about Satan. This also will be explained in back in the thirteenth verse. Satan, who comes and re-energizes, or comes and during the middle of the tribulation and actually indwells and makes alive again the body of the slain Antichrist, or this one world ruler which will be wounded unto death, we find in Revelation 13. And this is where you get this language here. The beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Uh, this beast, of course, is referring to Satan, who uh, is the world ruler, but he uses human instrumentality. So the time will come when actually he who is of the seven Will, uh, will manifest himself, and this is the last half of the tribulation period. We'll sum this all up for you. I know it might be getting a little deep here and hard for you to comprehend, but we'll sum it up before we quit tonight. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. This one hour just means for a short time. Now notice in the tenth verse it says there are seven kings. And notice in the 12th verse it says there are ten kings. Well, this seven kings means seven chronological rulers. Seven chronological world rulers in seven different times. The ten kings means ten nations that are being ruled by ten rulers at one time. That's the difference between the seven and the ten. See, it says of the seven, uh, look up at the seven again. You can tell this by the language. Of the seven kings, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. See, this is chronological. And then when you come down here to the uh, uh, ten horns, in the uh, ten horns, uh, which are ten kings, now a horn in the Bible is used as a political power because it shoves people around like a, 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 a spear with a good strong horn. This, this word horn in symbolic use is developed right through the Bible. Uh, I think we might have done that one time. Did we have a, have a Bible study and go back way back in Deuteronomy and show you the first time horn was used symbolically and then take it all the way through the Bible and develop it uh, so that you could see how a symbolic language in the Bible is developed from one end of the Bible to the other. I know we did this uh, one time. I don't know how many of you were here. But the ten, ten horns, remember, are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. Now, obviously, this has nothing to do, I mean, these aren't the seven, seven kings at all, because it says of the seven kings, five of them have received the kingdom and fallen, doesn't it? But when we get to the ten, it says none of the ten has received the kingdom yet at the time this was being written. But they're going to receive power as kings, power as kings, one hour with the beast. That is to say, the world ruler, the Antichrist, is going to rule through ten subordinate kings over ten kingdoms. That's yet to come. That's not here yet. Thirteen. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Now you can look back in the thirteenth chapter again and you'll see this. Fourteenth verse. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords, King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now this is speaking uh, of the time that's going to come in the 19th chapter of Revelation, uh, where we find the Messiah, the Lord, coming with all of his own. Look at uh, 19 verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, on his head were many crowns, and he 
had a name written that no man knew but he himself and he and so forth and so on and he'll say that uh, uh, he was king of kings and uh, and the uh, whole all of the saints uh, came with him this speaks of the time when we will come back to this earth with him as ruler see it says a, a, a door opened in heaven in the 11th verse and you see this uh, great one coming back. Well, he's called the lamb because he gave his life for the sheep and he's called the king of kings because when he comes again, he won't come as a lamb, he'll come as a king. We're back in 17th chapter now, 15th verse. And he said unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the harlot sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the harlot and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So we see that these ten kings that gave obedience to the false religious system is going to turn around and bring about its downfall. 17th verse. For God hath put in, in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the word uh, of God shall be fulfilled and the woman whom thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth 18th chapter and after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and is becoming is become the habitation of devils or demons and the hold of every foul spirit and the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Now this uh, verse here is taken right out of uh, uh, Jeremiah 50, 39. It's another one of the quotes from Jeremiah to, to explain your symbolism here. And this, uh, fly out, uh, uh, this cage for every bird ties you in with that uh, uh, parable, the kingdom parable, where the mustard tree grew up and fowls of every kind roosted in her limbs, speaking that uh, of the fact that the true church becomes a great monstrosity where every kind of a false religion can lodge under the name of Christianity. Third verse. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacy. Now, what we mean here is that the rulers of the earth bowed down to and gave this false religious system the honor due God. And the business people of the world, the great business magnets and so forth, went along with it that they might carry on their trade. And uh, so, uh, and also through the help. In other words, you find uh, the easiest way to get rich is to cater to somebody's religious belief and supply them with whatever they need to carry on their worship. This is why uh, in very, very poor nations, uh, like uh, the nations where Buddha is worshipped, the people are destitute, and yet the uh, temples, the Buddha and so forth, are uh, the most ornate and wealthy in the world. And uh, this is true anywhere where you have a false religion. This false religion gathers all the wealth to itself, and it bedecks its priests and its hierarchy with all kind of uh, great flowing robes and expensive things, and they build huge edifices, and uh, the leaders live in luxury, and, uh, and the people that worship live in oppression. Well, see, this is just the opposite from the way God would have things. And people are so stupid, they ought to be able to see through that. Uh, they ought to see through it when they see, say, a nation where all of the people live in abject poverty, and yet the religious system uh, has all the wealth. They just ought to realize that's just the opposite when the Christ was here and made himself poor for us and had nothing. And... Uh, 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 and that they claim, you see, to be his representative. Well, it just doesn't make sense, does it? Fourth verse. 
voice. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not her plague. Now, this does not literally mean, this, this is not literally directing a true born again Christian to come out of a false church. That's not what the intent is here, although that's a good thing to do. It, it, what it means is, if you are a member of the church of Laodicea, that is, if you're a part of the false church, come out of it by receiving Christ. You see, even if you leave your, left your membership in a church organization which is part of the false system, you come out of that church spiritually when you receive Christ as your Savior. It doesn't mean, uh, it's not talking about those who are physically on the membership rolls of such and those who are not. It means those who are truly Christians and those who aren't. Or uh, those who are truly followers of God and those who aren't. It's the difference between the Philadelphian church and the Laodicean church. That's why we studied that so that you could set the background. Remember, on the outside, you have Christ on the outside of the Laodicean church inviting those who are inside of that system to come to him. So you come out to him when you receive him as your as your savior and when you trust in him. Now the other is true too. The Bible says that uh, in uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, 6 that we're not to be yoked together with unbelievers. That is to say we're not to be doing God's work uh, hooked up with people who are not uh, not really his that uh, uh, who are involved. So so you can take this literally if you want to, but I just wanted to be sure that you knew the meaning. Now, you can prove this to yourself because it says in the last phrase, come out that ye receive not her plague. Well, if you're a born-again Christian, even though you're so spiritually inept that you remain in a false religious system, when the Lord comes and calls you home, you're going to go with the saints because you're born again. And, and so it's by receiving Christ as your Savior that you... Uh, avoid receiving the plagues or the judgments upon the false church. It's not by dis, uh, disassembling yourself with them from a membership standpoint. So I just wanted to make that clear. Fifth verse. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double under her uh, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled Fill, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself. Now this is true of the false religious system. They build up themselves. We even see this in uh, in some churches where there are a lot of true Christians. They build up their own name. They exalt themselves. Uh, they discredit anything that doesn't have one of their leaders uh, in... in uh, uh, the head of it. And you spend a lot more time, if you ask somebody that goes there, if you ask them if they're a Christian, they'll probably come right back saying no, uh, they won't say no, but they say, well, I'm a, uh, and name the, 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 the brand that they happen to be. And uh, they exalt, uh, a false religious system always exalts itself, just like she does here, whereas a true Christian exalts only Christ. And there's a strange uh, uh, doctrine that goes around that to that to uh, serve or love or cherish your local church organization is the same as loving Christ because Christ is the head of the church. This is not true. Your allegiance is to be to Christ. And your allegiance to a church or a local group simply is a byproduct or arises out of your allegiance to Christ. And you exalt him. You don't exalt your organization. And you don't exalt the name of your organization. And you better not have a name uh, if you're going to go around uh, exalting the name of that. Because you're doing what the false religious system does. It says right here, seventh verse, how much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously or luxuriously, so so much torment and sorrow give her, for 
She saith in her heart, I am still a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and fam uh, famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for the strong is the Lord God who judges her. For strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication, and live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her, when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, uh, uh, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, the mighty city, for one hour is thy judgment come. And this is speaking of, of the city figuratively, that is the false religious system. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. And the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and, and, and names the whole list of the things uh, that she trafficked in. And look in the 13th verse, the last phrase, and slaves and souls of men. And the fruits uh, that thy soul lusteth after are departed from thee and so forth. Now the rest of this chapter, just... Uh, same sort of a lament about the destruction of the false religious system and all of those who lament her destruction. Now with a few minutes left uh, that we have left, let me wrap this up for you and uh, then if you have some questions, all right. <clears throat> the Bible teaches that one day this earth, this world system will become so corrupt that God will want, not want his own people to be here anymore. Now, he wants us here now so that we can spread the message to others because we are the only instrumentality he uses now to tell others of God's love through Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so this is our job. We're ambassadors, the Bible says, for God at this time. But sometimes when the when the other country becomes too antagonistic, we call our ambassador home, don't we? When a foreign country becomes so antagonistic towards us that we feel like that our ambassador is in danger, we call him home. Well, we are ambassadors uh, for our heavenly kingdom here on this earth. And one day, this world <coughs> is going to be so antagonistic towards you uh, people won't want to uh, deal with you. Uh, they'll uh, uh, they'll call you a uh, false. Uh, they'll call you false religionist, and you won't be a part of your community because you'll be alienated because of your faithfulness to Christ. And as this time grows, pretty soon uh, the community will estrange itself from you until you couldn't be an effective ambassador anyway. So. God's just going to call you home. They will alienate themselves from your message, and there won't be a need for me here if you will have taken the message to those who need to hear it. And God's just going to take you home. Now, when you're not here anymore, somebody's going to have to explain to the world where you went and why you went. And the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2 that it's going to be the religious leaders who will have the answer. They will say, those folks that you don't see here anymore were obliterated by God. It won't be any more atheists, you see. Because somebody will know something supernatural happened. And uh, the religious leaders of the world will have the answer. It will say, God obliterated them because they wouldn't join up with us. And they will claim to be God's representatives. And they'll say to the nations of the world, unless you do like we want you to do, we're going to get the God to do the same thing to you. And this is the way they're going to get the obedience of the religious leaders of the world. And they're going to hold the religious, uh, the political power, the uh, ecclesiastical authority will hold the political powers in the palm of their hand. Because the political powers will will believe that God's judgment will be brought upon them if they don't. And this is why the harlot is going to be sitting upon the beast. But we find that uh, when Satan, in the middle of the tribulation, three and a half years after you're taken to be with Christ, uh, 
Satan is going to be cast into this earth. The world ruler will be mar will be uh, uh, shot or killed or something. He's going to be wounded unto death, the Bible says. And Satan will actually be permitted by God to come in and indwell. As a living spirit, he will in, in, uh, dwell the body of that Antichrist. You can read this. It's in the 13th chapter of uh, Revelation. And when Satan comes over and takes over the rule of the world by himself and lets all of his demonic spirits out of the uh, bottomless pit, as described in the 9th chapter of Revelation, he doesn't want any kind of worship, even false worship, except worship of him. And he's going to cause the kings of the earth to overthrow the false religious system, and, and the false religious system is going to be destroyed in one hour, as it says, or in overnight, practically. And they'll be done away with. Uh, they'll be annihilated. And there will be no more false religious system. It's gonna, only going to last for three and a half years. They'll live deliciously, and that's what these two chapters are all about, the downfall of the false religious system. The last half of the tribulation, the last uh, three and a half years, there won't be a false religious system except for Satan. And, and that's when Daniel says, the prophet Daniel says, the abomination of desolation or the idol that will be built in the temple in Jerusalem and the peoples of the earth will be made to worship that idol, which is a, a, a replica of this, uh, Satan and wealth human beings. Now, uh, that's what's going to happen to your religious system. Our series of studies has, has been uh, this particular series, uh, the rise and the fall of the false religious system known in the Bible as Jezebel because she was the uh, false, uh, was the uh, idolatrous queen that married God's king I said she was from Tyre. Actually, she was from uh, Sidon, uh, which is a neighbor city of Tyre, and which was controlled at that time by Tyre. So in one respect, she was from Tyre, but actually uh, she was a Sidonian. Uh, and she married, uh, against all the rules of God, she married uh, Ahab, who was king of Israel. And uh, he, she had, eventually, when she got power, had all the prophets, of God slaughtered and she brought in the prophets of her false religion to replace them. So this is why false religion is also referred to as Jezebel. It's called Jezebel. It's called Mystery Babylon. And we'll understand more about that after next week's lesson. It's called the Great Harlot by these names. You see, the Great Harlot has to be dealt with because before the Lord calls out his bride. See, just like the, the church is called the Bride of Christ, well, uh, the false uh, religious system or the great heart, as you might say, is the Bride of Satan. And everything that God has, Satan has a counterpart to it. Now, I thought we'd spend uh, at least one lesson back in the third and fourth chapters of Daniel. Maybe the, we'll hit the second chapter, too. The second, third, and fourth chapters of Daniel, where we're going to see Daniel prophesying the, the development of this long before it ever happened. He prophesied this hundreds of years before Christ, and he shows how the political, the social, and the cultural world is all tied in together. You see, Satan takes all of this. Man extols uh, his civilization uh, and his culture, and he tries to keep uh, the eyes of his fellow man on uh, art and education and the refinement of the world so that you keep your eyes off of the desperate wickedness of the human heart. And man likes to see himself as someone who's refined and someone who is getting better and better and actually uh, uh, the human race it can turn into just a, a bunch of dogs and animals in, in less than a generation. And this is what's going to happen during the seven years of tribulation. The, the human race will turn into violence when God's restraining power of the Christian uh, influence in the world is taken out of it. 
So I thought we'd go and, and study this by these statues uh, in uh, these visions that are seen in Daniel, and it might give you a little bit, a little uh, firmer meaning of this that we've been talking about. This is, is acknowledged, uh, knowledgeably, a, a hard subject, and uh, uh, it uh, might not have come through just right. And uh, let's take a couple of minutes here for questions. Anyway, for next uh, next week, if you want to read what we're going to be discussing, read the second, third, and fourth chapters of Daniel. Anybody have a question that we need to clear up? Is there anything in the Bible that says anything good about religion? Yes. Um, uh, it says true religion is undefiled, it defines it. That's in the book of James. Uh, Maybe, maybe you're talking about the fact that in one respect, uh, in one definition of religion, Christianity really isn't a religion because religion is, uh, is a system of uh, trying to make yourself acceptable to God, whereas Christianity, well, it becomes a religion. Uh, you don't become a Christian through religious practices, but you... Uh, can practice Christianity in a religious manner. So, in one sense, Christianity is not a religion, but it is. Look at James uh, chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows and their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's the definition of pure religion. So I could, suppose you could say that says something good about religion, doesn't it? Yeah, that's trying to find it, and everywhere I've seen it. Michael Christian. All religions. But it doesn't call it religion, does it? No, it doesn't say religion. What? Christian. Well, you're saying that. Well, Christianity is not religion in one sense of the word. See what religion is. Religion is a system of procedures whereby a man, man attempts to make himself more acceptable to his idea of God. Now, you can take everything from throwing your child on a burning pyre of fire because you think that placates God to whatever people do from a religious standpoint. And what they're doing, they're involved in a system of procedures to make themselves more acceptable to their own idea of God. That's what religion is. Now, you can perform religion then after you become a Christian. That is, a Christian should have a system for trying to make himself more acceptable to his idea of God. But you don't become a Christian by doing that. You become a Christian by receiving for yourself what God has done for you. So Christianity, you might say, is the only religion that you don't join by being religious. You can't become a Christian by becoming religious. Or that is to say, you can't become a Christian like uh, by acting like a Christian. You act like a Christian because you are a Christian. You don't act like one because to try to become one. And this is where we get all mixed up. Any other questions? Mr. Chesel, uh one has uh, seven mentioned so many times. Uh, most all the numbers in the Bible are seven or seventy-seven. Well, uh, the Bible uses much figurative language, and it uses numbers and in, in figures of speech. Uh, seven is not the only number that I know you said making ten, uh, but seven and uh, ten. There's quite a few numbers that are prevalent. Probably seven is the most used, and then other much used numbers would be ten and forty. Forty is used many, many times uh, symbolically, and twelve is used many, many times symbolically. Four is used quite often. Three is used quite often. And six is used figuratively. So uh, the Bible uses, makes a lot of use of figurative language, and seven is one of those figures of speech. And what seven signifies a completeness or uh, 
enveloping the whole subject. So seven uh, horns means this is the complete situation, the, the complete number of, of kings. Well, he is described as having seven eyes in several places, in Revelation particularly. The one with seven eyes, that simply means that he has complete vision. That's all it means. He sees everything. Anything else? Now we'll be uh, studying from the second and third chapters of the book of Revelation. But let's look first at the um, first verse of Revelation, first chapter, first verse, Revelation. It's called the revelation, that is, the unveiling or the unfolding or the showing forth of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, that is, God gave unto Christ, to show, not to hide, but to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Now, we're told here that the book of Revelation was written for the purpose of showing certain things to certain people, not to everybody. And it uh, said that it's signified. Now, you look at this word, and you can tell also that the word could be read signified. And the, uh, I understand the original Greek word can be, uh, can be translated either way. That is, made known by signs, or uh, with, with the signet ring on it, or, or with the stamp of approval. I don't really know which it means here. Probably it means signified, or by signs or symbols. And the reason that the uh, book of Revelation is written in symbolic form is because God wants to hide it to certain people. He doesn't want everybody to understand it. He doesn't want it to be uh, available to the uh, curious mind or the... Uh, uh, the intellectual mind. It, it's for God to be able to reveal certain things about that are going to come to pass to those who yield themselves to him as bond servants. And other people aren't eligible. Now, if you're not a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is to say, if you haven't yielded your whole to him uh, to do his bidding, then you may understand some details in the book of Revelation, or you may have a regard for some particular teacher or commentary, but you'll never really know in your si inside of you just what it's all about. And we've said before that the sign language is explained elsewhere in the Bible, and for it to really speak to you, you must see it somewhere else in the Bible, then you'll say, yes, I see now, that means this. So uh, it's a book written in sign language. Now, it was all future at the time it was written. But some of it is now history. Specifically, the second chapter and most of the third chapter is history. From the fourth chapter on, we were speaking of things that are still future. We skipped the first chapter, but the first chapter is composed mainly of a symbolic uh, picture, word picture of Jesus Christ, the risen Christ, as he looks over his church. The descriptive terminology here, if we had time to go into it, this is not our subject matter, the descriptive terminology uh, paints a picture of the risen Christ as he is head of the church, over the church. He's uh, among the uh, la uh, lampstands or candlesticks. Notice uh, in 119, Revelation 119, write these things which I have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, or lampstands. The seven stars are the angels, or messengers, of the seven churches, and the seven uh, candlesticks, or lampstands, which thou sawest, are the seven churches. Now the word seven here is being used 
symbolic. We're going to have seven letters to seven churches. But they were chosen because these seven local churches show forth the history, the pre-written history of the church. That is to say, what God did, he took seven churches, seven assemblies, seven groups of Christians who were meeting together uh, out of maybe hundreds and hundreds that were in the world at that time, but he selected seven because each one of these seven had some characteristics which uh, would be prophetic of the church at a particular age or a particular time. For instance, uh, of these seven churches, the first one represents the very early church, and uh, the second one uh, represents the church under persecution. When uh, when the Roman uh, authorities were uh, attempting to uh, stamp it out, there, it was the persecuted church. The uh, third a church here represents uh, the time of Constantine when the church was married to the state. That is to say, it amalgamated with the state. Uh, the uh, fourth church we have here represents the church of the Dark Ages. And the uh, fifth church represents the Reformation church, where, whereas the sixth church represents the spiritual church of the last time, and the seventh church represents the apostate church of the last time. This word apostate means the church that has departed away from scriptural truth. Now, we're not going to have time to do a real close verse-by-verse study of the second and third chapter of Revelation, because we want to get on into the 17th and 18th chapter, because this tells the destruction of the World Church, our study group, our series of lessons now, concerns the history of the non-believing church, or that is, uh, that a great group of people that make up uh, what's known as Christianity or Christendom, that, that don't, that those people that don't really uh, trust in Christ as their Savior. If you would... And this was the end of this tape.